Praise the Lord. On today, we will be having our Bible study lesson on Lesson 10. The subject for um, Lesson 10 is Christ's messages to the churches. So we know that there were seven messages, I mean, excuse me, seven churches, and there were messages for each of those churches. Well, this part two, we're going to deal with the last three churches. Um, so it says Jesus Christ admonishes and encourages his churches. So as we look at the scripture, it's going to talk about how he admonished them, how he rebuked them and corrected them for what for the wrong that they've done. And then it also talks about how he also encourages them. So this lesson is the second part in our exploration of the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which we know of today as Western Turkey. This lesson examines the letters to the churches in Sardis. Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In each case, the Lord Jesus used examples from the city of their location to illustrate his message. Sardis boasted of vibrancy, but was dead. Philadelphia was weak, but enjoyed the favor of the strong Lord. Laodicea claimed abundance, but was in reality wretched and poor. In each case, the Lord called on the church to look to him for help, and he gave promises to those who would overcome the evil in this world. So I'm going to give you a historical literary background. It says, in the Revelation, there are several repeated features in each of the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. In the first part, Jesus describes himself in terms of the vision revealed to John in Revelation chapter 1. The second portion of it is the church is commended for faithfulness. The third part is the church is rebuked for spiritual and moral, moral failure. Part 4, Jesus commands Jesus commands of the church an appropriate response to his rebuke. 5.5, 5, Jesus promises blessings to those who remain faithful to him and overcome evil. And six, and the church is commanded to hear in the message of Christ the voice of the Holy Spirit. Occasionally, the rebuke or commendation may be omitted or the order changed slightly. So, we're first going to look at point one, dealing with the fifth church, which was Sardis. Now, just introducing this lesson I want to put something in your mind I want you to think about appearance versus reality appearance versus reality I want you to think about that and think about those words have you ever been misled by the appearance of something maybe it was a book that didn't measure up to the title or cover maybe it was a house that looked nice on the outside but was in terrible despair on the inside. Appearances can be misleading. You will be reminded of this as we study the Lord Jesus' message to the churches in Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. In each instance, the Lord's vision of each church differed from the way they appeared to themselves and others. So I want you to think about that, appearance and reality. Something can look a certain way. Or, proje or be projected a certain way. But in reality, it could be completely different. So let's look at the fifth church, Sardis. Be spiritually alert. So this is the rebuke that Jesus gave to him. He says in part A of this, in his rebuke, the city of Sardis boasted a, his boasted a history that stretched back to more than a thousand years before the time of Christ. It was located on a craggy mountain peak that made it nearly impossible to reach by invaders. Deposits of gold nearby made Sardis extremely wealthy. So this is just giving a background of what Sardis was actually like, what it looked like. So it was up on a hill. The city was wealthy because it was surrounded by gold. So, um, Sardis was extremely wealthy because of this gold. 
However, an earthquake in AD 17 left the city so de devastated it never fully re recovered. So that earthquake basically decimated Sardis. So in his message to the church in Sardis, Jesus changed the order of his previous messages to the churches by issuing a rebuke first. The church in Sardis had a reputation for being alive, but in reality, they were spiritually dead. They stayed busy, but lacked the vitality of true spirituality. Jesus described himself to them as holding the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God or the seven spirit of God is a reference to the Holy Spirit in his perfect plenitude as the enabler of the Messiah, the Holy Spirit is the source of spiritual and eternal life, and this was needed by the church in Sardis. Jesus said they were dead, lacking the true life of the Holy Spirit. So when we look at that, it, said, it is said the citizens of Sardis thought more highly of themselves than was deserved because of their long history of wealth and security against invasion. Nevertheless, the city had been invaded and conquered several times since then because the citizens of Sardis were not as watchful of enemies as they should have been. So that really says a lot right there because God is letting them know, you know, they here it is, they, they have all this pride and thinking, you know, well, we're wealthy, you know, we sit up on a hill, we have all this gold, we're doing all these things. How can we apply that to today's time? And Jesus is saying, um, but you're spiritually dead. So you can be busy in the church and doing things for God outside of the church, just doing all kind of things. It's like somebody said, oh, it's like in a, in a marriage, a, a a spouse could say, well, I pay the bills or I keep the house clean. But you really don't have that personal relation. You're not really communing and, and staying in close relationship with God like you should. You're not feeding your spirit. You're not doing what you are supposed to do. So you remain dead. You're, you're so consumed with self. You're so consumed with busy and all kind of activities, being busy just doing all kind of activities that, you don't have time for God. So he called that when you're doing all these things but and you're so consumed with yourself, you become spiritually dead. To a point, it began to manifest that spiritual deadness of them not being a watchman on the wall. Like if they were praying like they were should, they would know. The Holy Spirit would lead them. They would guide and direct them and let them know that they need to be watchmen on the wall. Invaders are coming or are on their way. They would have been prepared. They would have been ready. So because they were so self-consumed with activities, business, and, their, and themselves, the, inv the invaders were able to just come in and, and invade their community multiple, on multiple occasions because of it. So this may account for Jesus' warning to them, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. The only way for them to recover the spiritual life they needed for their very survival was to repent, and this Jesus commanded of them. So Jesus let them know, you've been so full of busyness and so self-consumed with yourself and, and all these different activities, you need to repent. So that's the remedy for them. And, and we know to repent is to change, it's a turning point. So they no longer continue. It's, we have to recognize that wrong, what it is that we need to turn from that's hindering our walk with him. Once we know that, we have to make the change. So, commendation for some. Still there were some in the church at Sardis who had remained spiritually alert and faithful to Christ. So there were still a few people who were, who were alert and who were consistent in still being faithful to Christ. By means of continuing consecration of their lives to Christ, they had not defiled their garments, meaning they had kept themselves in the grace of Christ, purified of corruption of sinfulness. 
So that means a lot of the others who weren't spiritually alert had got contaminated. They began to be corrupt with sin. So the reward promised to these faithful believers by Christ was likened to a Roman victory processional wherein white robe citizens joined a conquering hero in a victory parade. These faithful believers in Christ would be prepared to be with Jesus in his victory celebration at his coming again at the end of age. So he's letting them know. He's letting them know those who have been spiritually alert to those faithful, you know, to continue to hold fast because when he comes again, they will they will be with him. He's also letting those know who have been contaminated and corrupted and spiritually dead to repent so they can follow suit with the others as well who have been spiritually alert. So here's the promise that he gave. The promise given to faithful believers was also given to those in the church in Sardis who would overcome evil by repentance. Was also given... um, they too would join in Christ's procession in the white garments he provides. Their names would not be blotted out of the book of life, which is so important. Ancient Greco-Roman citizens kept rosters of their citizens, which became a source of pride. The citizens of the church in Sardis had the opportunity to be listed in heaven's roster, and the triumphant Jesus would gladly announce their names before his father. By hearing the Spirit's words and awakening from their deathly slumber, they would not miss the glorious promise made to them by Jesus. So Jesus letting them know once they repent and get on board, then and consecrate themselves, they too will be found in the book of life when that time comes. So the message of Jesus of Jesus to the church in Sardis informs us that Being busy with religious activities is not the same as having a life-transforming spiritual relationship with Christ by faith. We can slip into spiritual deadness while while doing no end of religious things because we neglect to give attention to daily cultivation of our, our relationship with Christ. We've got to continue. We have to look at this, even though he's speaking to Sardis, we still have to look at this as, as to say, for us, today's church, today's Christians, we have to make sure that we're not spiritually dead. We still have to make sure that we're not just around here doing all kind of religious activities, being busy, doing things. Even though we're doing it for God, even though we're doing things um, for the kingdom, we still have to make sure that we're not. We still have to make sure that we're cultivating our relationship with him. We still have to make sure that we're seeking his face. We're communing with him. We're having our quiet time in his word, praying to him to receive instructions from him. Okay? They, they lack that. Sardis did. So we have to make sure that we don't lack that. And if there's anything in us like that, then we need to repent and make that change. So... <clears throat> To remain spiritually alive, it is necessary that our consecration to Christ be an ongoing day-after-day commitment. Christ is himself the source of our spiritual and eternal life, and we will not have spiritual and eternal life without him. Now, the next church is Philadelphia. Hold on to Christ. So this is what he lets them know. The city of Philadelphia got its name from an ancient king, Attalus II, who succeeded his brother to the throne. Adalus had demonstrated such loyalty to his brother before his dis, before he passed, before he died. He was dubbed Philadelphus, Greek for love of brother, the name he shared with the new outpost Philadelphia situated atop. An active earthquake fault. This geographical fact is alluded to in the message Jesus sent to the church there. Jesus lavished praise on the Philadelphian church and did not issue any rebuke to them. He described himself to them as the one who is holy and true and holds the key of David. In the Old Testament, God is called the holy and true God. Thus, Jesus ascribed to himself titles of deity because he is God the Son. Jesus declared himself to be the holder of the key of David, 
that is mentioned in Isaiah as being prophetic of the Messiah, the descendant of King David, whose kingdom will never end. As the holder of the key of David, Jesus opened and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man opened. This self-description of Jesus was encouraging to a church faced with persecution and described as having little strength, but before whom Jesus had set an open door of opportunity to be victorious over those who opposed them. They would not be kept from experiencing the promises and promises of God for them. Their faithfulness and endurance for Christ would be rewarded. The Lord Jesus said they would be kept secure from a coming time of trial. Jesus issued one command to the Philadelphian believers. Hold that fast which thou hast no man. Take thy crown. This was this was what Philadelphians had been doing. So this was a command to continue in their faithfulness to Christ, knowing he would come again and reward them. Jesus warned that they not let anyone take their crown of life meant it could be lost to their opponents only if they permitted it by ceasing to remain faithful to Christ. So he's letting them know you're doing really well. You're, um, but we want to. We want you to continue to do well. So the warning that he gi gives to them, don't allow any opponent, don't allow any enemy or anyone uh, to cause you to lose um, your faithfulness. So, and to no longer hold on to me. So this is the promise he made. The promise Jesus made to the Philadelphian believers were rich in meaning. First, the Lord would make them a pillar in God's temple forever. So he's letting them know, as long as you hold on to me and you remain faithful, I will make you rich um, for my kingdom. Just like the temple, the pillars, I'll make you a pillar in my temple. He also um, said spiritually the Christians there were immovable, were an immovable pillar. They would be identified by the Lord's name, by the name of the new Jerusalem, and Christ would write on them his new name their identity would be in opposite contrast to those marked as worshipers of the beast their identity is also placed them among those who will enter the new jerusalem with the name of god upon their foreheads what is jesus new name it is the king of kings the lord of lords the name of which he is victorious over all forces of evil his promise to the philadelphia believers was that they would share in his victory so like the Philadelphia believers, there are times when, this is how it relates to us today, there are times when we may feel like we have little strength or power against the evils in the world that oppose our faithfulness to Christ. The truth is our dependence for victory over the evil in the world can never be our own strength, but only on the strength of Christ. He holds the key of David. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he has all power and authority to triumph over the forces of evil on our behalf. Here again, the words of Jesus in the world, you shall have tribulation, pressure to conform to the world, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The victory of Christ is our victory if we have it also. So he's just letting them know, hold on, you'll be rewarded. I'll make you a pillar just like you, you are a pillar in your own church and, and community. Now, point three, the last uh, church, Lady Osea, be zealous and repent. So he lets them know in, the re in his rebuke. Now, Lady Osea is located on major trade routes. Lady Osea was noted for banking and wealth for the production of a much desired wool for making garments and for hot springs located nearby used in the production of a popular medicine I salve. So all of these are alluded to in the letter to the Laodiceans, showing how much the church there was becoming like their environment. The letter to the church in Laodicea, one of the longer of the seven letters, begin with a rebuke and contains commendation for the church there. After reminding the church in Lady Osea, who he is, the amen, faithful, and true witness in the beginner of all creation, Jesus began with his rebuke. He informed them that he knew their works and that they were, spiritually speaking, lukewarm and fit only to be spewed out of his mouth. Then Jesus' rebuke of the Lady Oseans continued. 
He said they were deceiving themselves about their real spiritual condition while they professed to be rich and increased with goods to the point of having need of nothing. They were, in fact, spiritually wretched, miserable, and poor, blind, and naked. The Lord's rebuke of the Laodiceans revealed the difference between their deluded self-perception and Christ's knowledge of them. He saw them as vastly different from and much worse off than they saw themselves. So that, that has a lot to do with that appearance versus reality. Okay? They saw themselves very wealthy, very successful. He saw themselves as uh, very wretched, very poor. Okay? Um, the Lady of Sears Church was poor, naked, blind, those surrounded by gold, wool, and eye salve. Jesus called on them to obtain, in fact, what they wrongly thought they had already possessed. Jesus challenged them to obtain from him gold purified, garments washed spotless and salved to heal their spiritual eyes to restore their vision. These were all metaphors for their spiritual wealth, their holiness, and their spiritual vision that they needed to obtain from Christ. He concluded in his rebuke, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, Jesus' love for them called for their repentance, their obedience to Jesus would restore their fellowship with him. So here it is. They have all these riches. They have all this money. And they think they have come to a point where they have arrived. And Jesus letting them know, no, you have not arrived. Um, you're actually spiritually poor right now. So you have to, we have to make sure that when God is blessing us, when we have abundance, even if, you know, God bless you to um, be a blessing to others, to, to be, even if you're a millionaire or billionaire, you still have to be humble. You still have to seek God the way you were seeking him before you came into wealth. But you have, that's what they were missing. So he let them know, repent and return back to me so they had to repent the promise he said was in keeping with this promise to have fellowship with those who would give him entrance into their lives jesus also promised to those who would overcome evil by trusting him and by faithfulness to him that they would sit with him in his throne just as he sit with his father in his throne this language emphasizes the close relationship between god the father and the son and that the believers in christ have fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. To be sitting in the throne with God, the Father, and the Son would be a blessing far removed from the pitiable state in which Jesus found the Laodiceans. So, how this applies to us. Many are familiar with the Warner Selman painting, Christ at, Christ at Heart's Door. Based on the scene depicted by Revelations, a radiant Christ is pictured knocking at the door. Some have observed that door in this painting lacks any kind of latch or entry mechani mechanism on the outside. It must be open from within. While the title of the Selma's painting speaks on the, of the heart's door, the invitation of Jesus Christ was addressed to the Lady Ocean's Church. Christ desires fellowship with individual believers. He also desires fellowship with the corporate church, united in worship and ministry. While the vision of Revelation chapter 1 indicates that Jesus is standing with his churches, the, this particular church had locked himself, had locked him outside. So it's like, can you imagine, they're, they're, they're still having services, they're still having worship services and everything, but Christ is outside, he's, he's not in. He's not in at all. So there's no presence there, there's nothing. So, lacking his radiance, they proceeded inside with business as usual, unable to see their wretched condition. The same thing can happen to us if we do not continually welcome Christ into our lives individually and also into the life of the church corporately. We need Christ. So, the whole thing is, no matter how much wealth you may have, you still need Christ. You still need to commune with him. You still need you need to make sure you have him. You open up your heart to him. Make yourself available to him so you can be a vessel. Um, and you also do that when you come together in, in a church setting. Corporately, we're still to do that as a body. Um, so this is how we um, are to, we should look at these 
last three churches of of what they had, the issues that they had. So he's letting us know for Sardis, those in Sardis who he, Christ Warner, will be dressed in white, a symbol of purity and victory will be acknowledged in heaven's book of life. So t- as today's Christians, we can fall into the trap of being ensnared in the church the church in Sardis as we merely go through the motions of practicing our faith without really feeding our spirit. We can avoid becoming the living dead by engaging in our faith through Bible study, prayer, and fellowship. So even though we're doing these things, we still must have have that quiet time, that devotion time with him, and also love each other as well as we're doing that. For the Church of Philadelphia, the message to Philadelphia shows us that the blessings that come when we maintain our faith despite life's tribulation, in fact, those who persevere despite weaknesses will stand strong as pillars in heaven. So they went through a lot of persecution because they were faithful. So even though we're living in this time of pandemic and there's a lot going on, God still wants us to be faithful. Even if we can't meet corporately, in a building, we still need to be faithful to him, corporately and individually. And we don't need to give up our faith. We don't need to throw in the towel. We need to keep moving because there is an award. He said that when we continue to remain faithful to him, we become a pillar, which means that we're stable, and then he will uh, make us a pillar in his temple. So um, for the church of Laodicea, he lets us know, that like the church of Laodicea, it's easy to become complacent in our faith during the times of abundance. Christ warns us in this revelation that he will spit out lukewarm disciples. Instead, Jesus urges us to keep seeking the Lord's face even after his hand has bestowed riches on us. So no matter how much wealth we have, how much blessings we, we have, how much abundance we've come into, We are still to seek his face. We are still to depend on him and know that everything that we have comes from him. It's not our own and that we are to continue to seek after him. Thank you.